Well, good morning and welcome to worship at Gospel Fellowship PCA. My name is Matt, one of the pastors. Very glad to have you with us here in person this morning. If you're new or visiting, Gospel Fellowship is a Bible-believing church, uh, reformed in our theology. We love Christ. We're on a mission to share the gospel with the world. So if you're looking for a church like that, you found one this morning. We're very glad you are, you are here with us. And look, no ropes. We have no ropes in the pews today, so you can have your original pew back. Uh, after months of having to sit in the wrong pew, so we're thankful for that. Um, if you're tuning in online, thank you for joining us on our, our YouTube videos. Of course, we post all of our videos here on this YouTube channel. You can subscribe to the channel if you like. We also have a podcast available if you like to listen while you're driving or working around the house, so you can subscribe to that too. Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church is the name of our, of our podcast. Of course, we'd love to have you come be with us here in real life here. We are situated just north of Pittsburgh, south of Butler, east of Cranberry, west of historic Saxonburg. If any of those places sound familiar to you, then you were probably within driving distance of us, and we'd love to have you. We have services at 8.30, 11 o'clock, and 4 o'clock p.m. All right? Well, hey, let's look at the bulletin together for here just a minute. We have a lot going on this summer. There's a number of groups, studies, programs, events happening. We have a Pirates game coming up here in just a a few short weeks from now. We have Angle Ball resuming on Monday. Monday nights we'll be having Angle Ball. We have ladies' needlework or handiwork gatherings coming up. You can see that on page 6 of your bulletin. I wanted to mention as well that this Wednesday night, that's this Wednesday, we're going to have our lectures on critical theory, a Christian response to critical theory. There's going to be two lectures on Wednesday night with a coffee break in between. The first one starts at 6.30. I'm hoping to have a full house for that, so if you want to invite a friend to hear how Christians might respond to this very divisive topic that's taking place across our nation today, we'd love to have you come out for that time together. All right, well, there's plenty of other information for you in your bulletin. I'm not going to read it all to you, but you have a nice calendar there of this coming week's events on page 5. And having said all that, let's take a few moments now to prepare our hearts for worship as we listen together to the prelude. Thank you, John. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord made the whole earth, the whole world, the universe in six days, and he rested on the seventh. Therefore, he gave us this day, this special day, to gather together as the people of God, to rest, to worship, and to be together as his people. So let's be called to worship from Psalm 80. It's printed for you in your bulletin. Scripture says, You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Let's go ahead and stand up together. If you're able to stand, we're going to sing hymn number 53, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, uh, we come before you this morning as a corporate body to worship you. As we enter into your presence, we cannot do so rightfully without first recognizing and confessing our own sin. We follow too often the devices of our own hearts. We have erred and strayed from you like lost sheep. We are often too busy to pray. We feel too guilty to approach you and are too fearful to confess to you that we neglect to acknowledge your rule in our lives. Have mercy on us, we pray, and forgive us our sins, that we may be your faithful people, obeying your commandments, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, hear now these words of assurance taken from Romans chapter 9. If we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Uh, let us confess our faith together uh, from Romans chapter 5, printed there in your bulletin, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, again, we ask you to make use of the uh, offering plates found in the narthex, of course. So you can also give online at our website. It's uh, printed there in the bulletin for you. As we prepare our hearts for the offertory, please uh, hear these words uh, from Luke chapter 12. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Let us continue to worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings. And I do apologize, we're actually going to pass the plate, so... Please rise for the singing of the Gloria Patri.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings. We give you thanks for sustaining us and providing uh, to us what is necessary and sufficient. Accept now, we pray, these tithes and offerings. We pray that they be used for the betterment of the church, the furtherance of the gospel, and the building of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you may be seated. Our New Testament reading is taken from 1 John chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Our verse of the month this month uh, comes from Isaiah uh, 45. It's printed there in your bulletin. Uh, let us recite it together. Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all of the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other power. That's 45, 22. Uh, please remain seated and turn to uh, the Psalter selection for today, which is 104A. together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day, this Lord's Day, this Sabbath day of rest in which your people can come together to give you praise and thanks. And we do, Lord, join our hearts with the writer of Psalm 80, uh, your, uh, your scribe Asaph, who begged you in Psalm 80 three times to restore us. Three times he said to restore us. And he asked, Lord, that you would let your face shine upon us that we may be saved and we repeat that prayer to you even this day generations later <clears throat> we pray father that your glory the same glory that you had uh, since before the foundation of the earth your same glory that you had from the days of the prophets and the apostles and the life of our lord jesus christ that same glory would shine forth upon us today lord that you would stir up your might 
that you would come to save, that you would give us life, Heavenly Father. We pray, Father, that you would give us revival and renewal, restoration and unity, not only in our churches, but across this nation and, Lord, throughout the world. We do pray for a great outpouring of your blessing and your favor upon us. Lord, we cannot help but mention a few names of those who are precious to us that we would ask your your blessing upon. We think, of course, of Pastor Nick and his continual struggles with cancer. We pray for Linda and their family as well. Lord, for Gloria, who is now back from the hospital, but Father, uh, still needing your tender help and your mercies, we thank you and pray also for Russell Gorley, Lord, and the Gorley family, that you would uphold them as he struggles with health-related issues. Father, there are many others that, that we could name, and we think of some of them even now in our hearts. But Lord, we also uh, desire to carry forth the name of Christ and the gospel in this community. And so, Lord, this summer we have plans that we're hoping that you would bless in your favor. Lord, we pray for CRP. Sixty plus years, Lord, we've tried as a congregation to reach our community with the gospel through ministering to children. We pray, O God, that even this summer would be yet another harvest of souls, young people, that might even come to know you as Lord and Savior through the ministries and events of this summer's CRP program. Lord, even as we will be doing again something for many years in CRP, so also we try something new with our Compassion Project and outreach to the poor in our community. Father, we do pray that the meals that we bring them this summer would, would be a relief to the burdens of life for those, and that you would even give us opportunities to share the gospel with them over a meal given in compassion. Lord, we pray even for this Wednesday, the lectures on critical theory. Of course, we'll be preaching the gospel on Wednesday, and we pray that the gospel would shine forth and show itself to be a better word than what the secular world has to offer for us, and that it would be a more unifying word of hope and truth and peace amongst your people. And Father, even for ourselves right now, we pray for the illumination of the reading of your word, We pray that you would shine forth your truth from the Holy Scriptures, that you would help the preacher this morning to be clear and faithful, edifying in all that he says. We pray, Father, that we would have eyes to see Christ, ears to hear truth, the truth, the only truth in your word. And God, that you would even prepare our hearts as we come in a few moments to the Lord's table, where we will graciously feast upon the good things that you have set before us. And now, Father, we pray that you'd hear us as we join our hearts together and pray as Christ taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Church, let's grab our Bibles. We're in Isaiah chapter 44 today as we continue our study through this great prophetic work. Isaiah chapter 44 is our text. Uh, When you find this, let's go ahead and stand up together as we recognize that God's Word is holy, infallible, inerrant, inspired, and all that it says and teaches, perfect in all that the Word reveals to us. Isaiah chapter 44, we're going to read verses 9 through 20 this morning. So listen now to the word of the great and living God. Isaiah 44, verse 9. All who fashion idols are nothing, and the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. Who fashions an idol or casts an idol that is profitable for nothing? Behold, all his companions shall be put to shame, and the craftsmen are only human. Let them assemble, let them stand forth. They shall be terrified. They shall be put to shame together. Verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. 
He cuts down cedars or he chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes a part of it and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. Also, he makes a god and worships it. He makes an idol. He falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat. He roasts it and is satisfied. Also, he warms himself and says, Aha, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol. And he falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and he says, Deliver me, for you are my god. Verse 18, they know not, nor do they discern, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so that they cannot understand. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, half of it I burned in the fire, I also baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deluded heart has led him astray, and he cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my right hand? May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Amen. You may be seated. I was at an Episcopalian retreat center in Orlando doing a, a week of doctoral studies for my demon when I was at RTS, and uh, kind of alone at this Episcopal Center, I, I stayed there because it was cheaper than a hotel, and I'm reading alone at the cafeteria one of the books for my class, and there's another group across the way in the cafeteria, and suddenly I sort of realized that I was being looked at. Have you ever had that feeling that people are looking at you? And sure enough, I looked up from my book, and and there they are looking at me, and and then again I went to reading, and there they are looking at me again, and pretty sure I I became convinced that they were actually pointing and laughing at me, and so by this point it's it's become obvious that this entire group of people is, is staring at me, and so finally the leader of the group walks over to me, and he says, uh, he explains himself, he says, we are uh, from the Eastern Orthodox Church, and, and we are on an idol or an icon painting retreat, an icon he called it, and the reason that we're laughing is because we looked at, at your face and we noticed that you look exactly like some of the icons that we're here to paint this week, and I said, oh really, I've never been thought of as a model before. He said, it's because your face, it's so thin, it's, so, it's, it's gaunt and emaciated. You look, you look exactly like some of the desert monks that were here to, to paint for our icons this week. And I, I suppose I could take that as a compliment, being gaunt and emaciated. And so they drew me. They, they drew me as St. Jerome for their icon, uh, their icon retreat. And I wasn't sure what to think about that. I mean, uh, we, we Presbyterians, we don't do much, we might say, with the visual arts as far as our, our worship services go. If you've looked around our, our sanctuary before, you probably notice that we don't have uh, some of those uh, visual iconographies that other church traditions have. If you look around the sanctuary this morning, you'll notice that we don't have any statues of the saints. There's no statues of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John like I had in my Lutheran church Growing up as a kid, we don't have uh, a portrait of St. Mary, the Virgin Mary, out in our narthex. If you look carefully enough, you won't even find in our building anywhere a, a portrait of Jesus. We don't even have a portrait of, of Christ in our building. And you, if you're from a different uh, historical Christian tradition, you might wonder why that is. I'd like to answer that question for you this morning. It's because uh, we as Reformed Presbyterians, we come from a tradition of the English Puritans and the Scottish Covenanters where they're very concerned that any sort of visual medium like that might inadvertently become, even in our worship services, an idol to us. Now obviously, uh, if you were to ask that group that wanted to paint me that day if they were making idols, they would have said no, they were not there to make idols They were there to make icons, and for them, uh, there's a distinction. If you ask them, they would say, we don't pray to it, we pray through it, and that's their explanation. 
but in the Presbyterian, English, Puritan, Scottish Covenanter tradition, we take much more care, I think, to ensure that we don't accidentally violate the second commandments of the Ten Commandments, which gives us this rule, listen to Scripture, it says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, they would tell you that they're not violating that commandment, but we, being more cautious on these things, are not so sure. Because if the second commandment means anything, it would be either, and probably both, A, that we don't worship any other image or uh, anything created as a god, nor do we believe that it's appropriate to worship the only living and true God through these sorts of things. And so we've taken this much more cautious approach when it comes to the visual and thus the plain style meeting houses that we tend to have as Reformed Presbyterians. And in our context today here in Isaiah chapter 44, we meet head on this topic of idolatry and the dangers of creating these visual media through which God or the gods may be approached. Of course, there's only one great and living God, as Isaiah has told us throughout his entire book. This is not the only place that Isaiah addresses the topic of idolatry in his book. In fact, 25 times at least, I counted instances where Isaiah attacks. He's in full attack mode against the idolatry of his day. Now, we've seen, as we've studied through the book of Isaiah, him mention idols a number of times before, but I've reserved this topic for today's text because I do think this is the most aggressive assaults on idols that Isaiah has in his book. And so we want to take some cautious time together to study this danger, the spiritual danger to our souls of idolatry. Now, throughout this book, we've seen Isaiah use all sorts of literary devices. We've seen him talk of visions. We've seen him give songs, as we saw with the servant songs recently. We've seen him do some historical narrative. We've seen long-form prayers and prophecies, oracles and woes. And yet today, in terms of our literary context, the strongest a literary motif that Isaiah is going to employ in this assault on idols is the literary technique of irony and sarcasm. Did you catch that when we read the text? How sarcastic Isaiah is being here in this text? He literally mocks them a couple of times in verse 19. Look, look, look how strong the sarcasm is here. He says, no one considers nor is there knowledge or discernment to say half of it I burned in the fire. I baked bread on its coals, I roasted meat and have eaten, and shall I make the rest of it an abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Do you catch the irony and the sarcasm there? Isaiah is saying, how can you worship this thing which you've made with your hands, this block of wood that you've carved and shaped, but you took the other half of the block of wood and you made a fire and you made your sandwich on it? You baked your bread, you roasted your meat on this half of it, and over here you're going to fall down and worship this? No. Clearly Isaiah is using rich sarcasm and irony to condescendingly attack the foolishness or the insanity, we might say, of idol worship. And so today in our sermon, what we want to do is we want to look at the irrationality, the insanity of idol worship. And so to do that, this morning, we're going to start off with a definition of idols. You might be surprised to see how broadly we can define this term. And then we're going to move more and more into application as we go. So if you have your Bible open, I hope you still have your Bible open. And let's begin again in verse 9. And let's work towards building a definition, a working definition of idolatry. Look at verse 9. He says, All who fashion idols are nothing. And the things they delight in do not profit. Their witnesses neither see nor know that they may be put to shame. So he starts off with a very broad assessment. He says, look at the text, all who fashion idols are nothing. So by the use of the word all, he's painting with broad strokes here, as there are in fact many kinds of idols, are there not? Now, there are some that are made with 
a metal. There are some that are made with wood. that are some uh, painted with paint brushes on canvas. There are others that are made of stained glass. There are others that are carved of marble. Some of them are very crude and ugly. Some of them, if we can even admit this, are actually quite beautiful. And Isaiah uses that word in verse 13. He says he shapes it into a figure of a man with the beauty of a man. So sometimes these visual media can, can in fact be very alluring to the eyes. There's all kinds of idols. There's all forms of idols. Some of them richly ornate, others of them very basic and similar. But what do all idols have in common? What is the one thing that ties all of these false forms of worship together? Well, we might consult the Apostle Paul on this topic because Paul in Romans chapter 1 says this. Listen carefully. You don't have to turn there. But Romans 1.22 says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So there's an exchange there. You see that? You're making a trade in idolatry for the glory of God, and you're accepting in its stead or in its place anything in the heavens, on the earth, under the seas. Remember the second commandment? Anything by which God's glory is exchanged for something far, far less than itself. Calvin says, be careful because the heart of man is an idol factory. It stamps them out one after the next after the next. The heart of man is an idol forge by which we continually mold and fashion and stamp more and more idols for ourselves. And so let's try this as a definition. Let's just start here. An idol is, here's my definition, anything whatsoever that robs God of, the, of his glory and his honor that he rightly deserves and exchanges it for something less in our hearts or in our minds or in our lives. How about that? I'll give it to you twice. An idol is anything whatsoever that robs God of the glory and honor that he rightly deserves in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. And right now, I, I'm just going to guess what you're thinking. A little mind-reading game here. You are congratulating yourself because you have never had a Baal idol in your home. You don't have any Asherah poles from the Old Testament in your living room. You don't have any Buddha statues anywhere in your house. You have not done what, what one person from another denomination told me to do, which is to bury a statue of the Virgin Mary in all four corners of your yard so as to protect yourself from curses and evil. You've done none of those things. And so you're saying to yourself right now, I'm getting off easy on this sermon because I'm not an idol worshiper. I don't do idols. But before we all um, inadvertently hyperextend our elbows, patting ourselves on the back because we don't have these kinds of idols in our lives or in our church. Let's remember again what we just said about the definition of an idol. It is anything whatsoever that robs God of the glory that he deserves in our minds, in our hearts, and in our lives. So with that, let's look at a couple of categories of idols. Can we do that? The subcategories under the heading of idol, I'll give you four of them. We're going to see some of them in this text. Others aren't going to be apparent in this text, but you're going to recognize them when you see them. So here's four categories of idols. Uh, category A, pagan idols. Pagan idols. These are the ones that Isaiah is talking about here in Isaiah chapter 44, obviously. Uh, you probably don't have pagan idols in your house or in your property or in this church. Okay, well done. Pagan idols, we could include all kinds of things from the Old Testament. Remember, Gideon tore down the Baal idol. Uh, some of the kings of Judah and Israel were graded as to their success as a king, whether or not they tore down the Asherah poles over the land. Uh, we see a statue of Dagon of, of the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 5. Uh, Paul goes to Athens, Acts chapter 17. He sees idols everywhere. In the city of Ephesus, they have a whole industry of 
idol, idolatry to Diana or Artemis, as she is variously called. All of these we can put under the category of pagan idols. You probably don't have any of those. But that doesn't mean you're off the hook. Second category. Religious idols. Uh-oh, watch out. They're going to sound good to you. They're going to, you're going to think that these are, are helpful. And this is why, of course, in certain ecclesiastical traditions, I do think the dangers of iconography can creep in and become a trap to the soul. I mean, obviously you're not going to have a statue to Dagon in your house, but, but what about Mary? What about the saints? And you say to yourself, well, these things are good. These are, these are biblical things. These are, these are right things. These are helpful things. I, I have a cross dangling from my rearview mirror in my car, and the reason I do that is because it brings me good luck. Does it, though? Does it have any sort of power? Do you think of yourself as more blessed or favored or protected because of these things? If so, they can very much become an idol to the heart. Remember that in the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 21, God gave the people this bronze serpent. It was a gift. It was, an, it was, a, it was a, a vestige of God's grace so that those who had been bitten by the fiery serpents could look upon it and be healed. Remember the story, Numbers 21? But then, generations later, in Hezekiah's day, they had to tear down and destroy that same bronze serpent because over the years, it had become something far greater in their minds than it actually was, and they began to worship it, unduly so. And so sometimes, if we're not careful, these religious idols that seem to suggest themselves as being right to us can actually be a snare to the heart. Category C, material idols. So we got pagan idols, religious idols, material idols. These are the things that we physically possess in our lives. We don't think of them as idols at all. But nevertheless, we give far more of our heart to them than we ought to. Think here of your boats or your golf clubs or your pet. Can a pet be an idol? You say, no way. Actually, it can. If it begins to take the love, and the time, the esteem, the affections of the heart that God is worthy of, you can take anything, your higher salary, whatever it is, and you can make that thing an idol. And then we come then to the fourth category, these are the most difficult to see because you don't even realize they've become idols for you. I'm just going to call these conceptual idols. Conceptual idols. So pagan idols, religious, material, conceptual idols. What are conceptual idols? Well, they're not things at all that you can touch with your hands or hold in your arms. A conceptual idol is something like, for instance, your reputation or your pride or your career or success or even Family. Now you say, how can family be an idol? It can, easily, when family takes the place of God as the most valuable thing in your life. Then it's become an idol, because nothing can take that place from God. So conceptual idols are in some ways the most dangerous for us, especially us who free our sanctuaries and our homes from these other kinds of more overt and obvious types of idols. Right? So that's our definition, anything that robs God of the glory that he deserves. Now, let's move on then in the text to say a couple more things about the dangers of these types of praise thieves, these praise robbers of God's glory in our lives. And let me simply say that the problem with idols is that they will demand everything from you and they will give you literally nothing back. All right? They'll demand everything, and they'll give you nothing back. That's the problem here. This is why Isaiah is mocking this man who's working so hard to create this idol by the sweat of his brow. Uh, look at verse 12 with me in your text, if you will. He says, The ironsmith takes a cutting tool, and he works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and he works it with his strong arm but then what happens look at verse 12 he becomes hungry and his strength fails and he drinks no water and he's faint have you ever spent a day in an iron forge before probably not i haven't i take it to be rather 
arduous work, though. This man here who's physically expending his labor and his strength, you can almost picture him. Can you see him next to the hot, molten fire? He's melting down iron. He's pounding it with the smith's hammer. He's sweating. He's becoming tired. He's becoming exhausted. If he doesn't want to make his idol out of iron or steel or metal, what does he do in verse 14? He goes out and he cuts down a cedar tree or a cypress tree. Now think back to the ancient times here in the Old Testament. You wouldn't get out your chainsaw. You'd get out your handsaw and you'd have to cut down this huge cedar tree and you'd want to work with the the best piece of lumber that you could possibly bring into your uh, into, into, your, into your, uh, your office or your studio or whatever it is you're working. You're, you're tired. You're, you're worn. This is hard work. This is physically demanding. And idolatry always is going to be physically demanding, spiritually demanding, emotionally demanding. It's going to take everything from you and it's going to give nothing back. All right Now, there's all kinds of difficult jobs physically difficult jobs. Mining is hard and welding is hard and being a deep sea fisherman is hard. But let me just tell you this. There is nothing that is so irrational, such a waste of time and energy and sweat and blood as idol production and idol worship. Because they will demand everything from you and literally give nothing back. Let me, let me just give you a, an example here. Um, think of what would happen if you made career your idol. Now, what category would that be in, by the way? Going back to my four categories, career, what would you put that? It's a conceptual idol, right? Because it's not something that you can hold on to with your hands. A conceptual idol of your career. And probably there's a few of us here in the room, I include myself in this, uh, that might set our careers a little bit too highly in our affections. And so what happens to you when career becomes your idol? Well, you start giving it things. You start feeding it things that it doesn't deserve. You'll give it more of your time than it deserves. And and what's going to have to sacrifice for that? Well, maybe you're going to give it time that you would otherwise expend in worship or prayer or devotion or with your family. Um, You're going to work hard to meet the demands of your career. If you want to be the best, I mean not just mediocre or not just good, but if you want to be the best, you've got to give your career everything. You have to obsess about your work. You have to constantly be angling for an edge to outdo your employer or your competitor or your co-workers. You are going to work so hard to please your boss, to please the board, to please the stockholders. But remember this, it's going to demand everything from you. And what is it going to give you back? Nothing. Because at what point, you have to ask this, at what point have I really attained what I finally want out of my career? At what point am I truly the best? Well, the second you become the best, you now have to work very hard to maintain it. See? Or let's suppose you choose physical attractiveness to be your conceptual idol. Anybody here? Don't raise your hand. Anybody have that as your idolatry? Physical attractiveness? Or health? It will demand everything from you and it will give you nothing back. Now, I'm not saying that some of these things we can't be thankful for. In fact, there's a, a, a whole, um, there's, there's, a, there's a true worship of God that we call gratitude when we're thankful for the things that he's given us. Food and family and a way to provide for our table. These are all things for which we give gratitude for. But listen, when something becomes an idol to you, you lose the gratitude And instead, it becomes an obsession to you. So if physical health and attractiveness is your idol, here's what's going to happen to you. Rather than receiving food thankfully, you're now going to resent the food that you eat because it's going to violate your calorie count or whatever it is you're doing to yourself to maintain the perfection of the body. You might even feel bad about eating food rather than being grateful for it because now it's working counter to the idol that you've established, which is your physical beauty. 
And the problem, of course, with physical beauty is that it's so fleeting, it's so brief, it's here today, it's gone tomorrow. The next day you wake up, your hair has to be redone, your eyebrows have to be redone, your uh, whatever it is, your clothes, it has to be repositioned and, and re-ironed and re-washed. And I, I, I knew a friend who literally spent one hour on her eyebrows every single morning. Can you imagine that? It, they just looked like lines to me. I didn't get it. I spent an hour. And the problem is, again, it will give you nothing back. It will give you no joy, no love, no happiness, no peace, because the moment you attain physical attractiveness, the harder you have to defend and maintain it, right? And so this is why Isaiah says, look down at your text again. Look at, look at, look at verse 20. Here's the result of this. Verse 20, he feeds on ashes. A deluded heart has led him astray. He cannot deliver himself or say, is there not a lie in my hand? At the end of the day, for all of the sweat and all of this effort, what do you get? You, you get ashes. That's it. Idolatry demands everything. It gives you nothing. And in this way, it is an anti-gospel because think about what is the message of the gospel? What is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? That he gives us everything and we cannot give him anything back for it, right? That's the gospel. He gives us grace. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us a greater happiness than the world can provide. And what does he demand from us? A pound of flesh? No. He only demands faith and repentance. So the gospel gives us everything in Christ, and it demands nothing from us, where idolatry is exactly the opposite. It demands everything from you and gives you nothing in return. That's why it's insanity. It's insanity. Now, before we wrap up here, um, let me then turn to application and try to suggest a few ways that you might become aware if there are idols in your heart. Okay? Now, uh, so like there's some, ob so, there's some idols that are so obvious it's like, duh, right? On uh, Friday night, we had 98 people over to our house for Sean's graduation party. It was a wonderful party, beautiful weather. Suppose you came over to my house and you found what's described in Daniel chapter 3 in my backyard, a golden statue that's 90 feet tall. That's what Nebuchadnezzar made, right? It'd be a pretty obvious idol. 60 cubits high, made out of pure gold, that's an idol. But what if it's these conceptual idols that are apparently invisible and we're not even aware that some of them exist? How then do you discern that you have an idol? How do you know? How do you know that something like family, which is good, hasn't usurped God's place as greatest in your heart? Well, let me give you four diagnostic questions that it will help you, I think, to determine whether or not you have a conceptual idol, right? Here we go. Here's one. Diagnostic question. Do you defend it vigorously when it is attacked? If somebody said anything to the contrary, would you vigorously attack that person for having critiqued you or it? Might be an idol. So, so let's say work has become an idol for you. And your boss gives you a a critique, not a, not, a, not a harsh criticism, but a critique of your project. You've been working on this project for weeks, and your boss says, you know, that's, that's pretty good, but, but let's, let's tweak it like this and do it this way instead. Would that bother you? Would that bring out the claws and the daggers? Would you then be willing to go to war to defend what you've done? Do you become furious and enraged because somebody said something even ever so mild about what you've done? If so, if you're ready to go to war with somebody because your idol has been challenged, probably is an idol then, right? Or parenting. Parenting is good. The Bible commends parenting. But what if somebody said something that caught you sideways about the way that you parent? Would you then be ready to go to battle with the person that said it? If so, perhaps even something as good as parenting become, can become an idol. 
Here's another self-diagnostic question. If this was taken away from you, would you sense a deep loss of self-worth? If, if, if what you had is gone tomorrow, would you no longer even be able to know yourself? This happens to people in ministry from time to time, right? Uh, this happens to people who have successful careers. Maybe they're a university professor or a teacher. Maybe they have a job that has some sort of reputation within the community. But then what happens? Sometimes jobs don't work out. Sometimes we move on for one reason or another. And sometimes when that thing is taken away from us, then we lose our entire self-worth. We lose our sense of identity. We don't even know what our purpose is anymore. If that's true, that thing, as good as it might be, might actually have become an idol in our hearts. It's a danger. I've heard, um, I can't confirm this, but I've heard that people that win the Olympic gold medal are actually at greater risks of depression and even suicide because their whole lives they've been working for this one thing, then they finally get it, and then what? They're no longer that person who can compete at this level when they have to retire. They don't know what to do with themselves. Here's another self-diagnostic. Are you confused and appalled when other people don't cherish it to the same degree that you do? If somebody else doesn't love the thing that you love as much as you love it, you don't even get it. It's like, how do you not love chihuahuas? Like, they're amazing. They're cute. They're small. You can put them in your purse. Like, how do you not love chihuahuas? And you're like appalled that somebody else doesn't think the same way about you as you do about this particular thing. That might be an idol. Or how about this? Last one here. Would you break relationships with people that you love over this particular issue? Would you actually cut people out of your life because of this? You might think of politics here a little bit, right? Can politics become an idol? Absolutely. You know it is when you're willing to cut people out of your life because they don't agree with you or they attack your favorite politician. And so the reality is here, while probably none of us are going to do what Isaiah is mocking here so clearly in Isaiah chapter 44, we're probably not going to go home and cut an idol out of a piece of wood and bow down to it. The reality is these conceptual idols are far more dangerous to our souls. And so what do we do then? I'm just going to end with this point, then we're going to go to the Lord's Supper together. What do you do when you find that there's an idol in your life? Well, there's only one option. You have to tear it down. And the reason you have to tear it down is because God will not yield his glory to any other God, for are there none, nor will he yield his glory to any idols. The Lord God cannot coexist with your idolatry. Right, there's a story in 1 Samuel 5, I alluded to it earlier, where the Philistines, they have their god Dagon. He's a statue of their god, right? And in this particular moment in redemption history, they have captured the Ark of God and they bring the Ark of God into the same temple in which they have the statue of Dagon. You remember the story? Remember what happens? I love the story. They, they go in the next day and Dagon has fallen flat. And his head breaks off and his hands break off and there's a real interesting uh, irony there because it's, me, Scripture mentions a number of times the hands of the Lord working in power, but Dagon's hands break off. Because God cannot exist. He cannot coexist. He will not coexist with your idols. So the only choice is to tear them down. Now, there are certain idols that you can't eliminate. Obviously, you don't want to eliminate your family from your life. You can't do that. So what do you do then? Well, what you have to do then, if you can't destroy the idol, is you have to pray that God's esteem would be raised in your heart and that your love and valuation of the idol would be removed back to its right and proper and fitting place in your heart. See what I'm saying? You have to pray. You have to pray, God, Lord, I beg you that you would restore to me, that you would give back to me a right and fitting esteem and estimation of your incomparable worth. And Lord God, I pray that you would help me to then restore my 
my wife or my children or my career or my health, whatever it is, to a right and proper position of gratitude within my heart so that it doesn't steal and rob what rightly belongs to you. And this is why in 1 John chapter 5, our New Testament text this morning, the Apostle John ends his book on such a strange closing line. Have you ever noticed how strange it is that 1 John ends with this line, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It's interesting, isn't it? Because he hasn't mentioned idols anywhere else throughout the book. He hasn't even brought up idols. And then he just ends on that. Not goodbye, not see you later. Just keep yourselves from idols. Why does he do that? Well, because throughout the entire letter of 1 John, he's been consistently reminding us that we must love God with the heart and we must love the church truly and really from the heart, but nothing else can take those things place. So let's go ahead and stand together. We're going to sing our closing hymn or our, uh, our transition hymn here as we prepare our hearts to go to the Lord's Supper. If you would grab your hymnal out, let's go ahead and stand and sing. And elders, I'll ask you to join me at the table. <laughs>